Well, good afternoon, ICHE family. <laughs> Woo! Hey, we are so glad you are here. Every year, we're glad you're here, but especially this year, we are celebrating our 40th birthday. Isn't that nice? Now, I know you're thinking, Kirk, you don't look a day over 25, but believe me, I am. For 40 years, ICHE has been here to protect homeschooling rights, and can we say God's grace has been upon the state of Illinois if in no other area they get homeschooling right. Amen? Aren't we grateful? I was at a conference with our folks from Indiana, and they proclaimed they were the best state to homeschool in. I had to get up and rebuke them kindly. This is the best state to homeschool in. So we've been protecting rights for 40 years, and most important to my heart is we've been promoting a vision of home discipleship with the centrality of Jesus Christ. And that is the DNA, that is the heartbeat of ICHE. When we say Illinois Christian educators, we really mean the Christian part. And I know many of you already know that. We want to re-emphasize that today. As I opened up the speaker's dinner last night, we talked about Jesus Christ being the Alpha. And on Sunday morning when I preach, he'll be the Omega, the last thing that we talk about because it's all about him. Uh, folks, we want this to be just a glorious weekend for you. My first encounter with ICHE, I think, was in 1999, 25 years ago. My wife and I would come up here from southern Illinois to escape because nobody knew us up here. We kind of messed that one up a little bit, though. Uh, first speaker that year was Mr. Ken Ham. 25 years ago, Ken was here when I first attended ICHE. And him and a few other speakers God used to just impact our lives and basically turn it upside down. Uh, it's changed our entire legacy. And that's my prayer for you this weekend. You will hear some things you've never heard before, some things you think, well, I should have thought about that. God will open up your eyes. And folks, when he does that, that's God's blessing. I'll be honest with you. We've brought friends up here before and they came one time and never came back again. That's not good advertising, is it? Because they saw what they were doing wrong. When we saw what we were doing wrong, we know that God chastises those that he loves. And so as God shows you new things this week, praise God. Be excited for that. God is at work in your life. And day by day, as you seek to obey him, he will transform your home for his glory. So first timers, we're so glad you're here. How many first timers are here right now? Wow, great, fantastic. Welcome them. Hey, just enjoy the journey, first timers. You'll learn things this time that you will be able to do differently next year. Just enjoy. And sometimes when the water holes is just turned full blast and you feel like you're drowning, just take a breath, draw it in, take one, two, or three things home from here that you can apply into your house. And day after day and year after year, you'll see your home uh, transformed. We're so grateful for all of it. Nazarene University, they've been a great host um, campus for us. So many great things to do. We'll talk about here momentarily. But please uh, welcome Mr. Luke Franklin. He is Executive Director of Enrollment here at ONU. Kirk, thank you so much. Um, it is so great to see this room beginning to fill up and all of the faces here. Um, selfishly, I love having the ICHE conference here each year. My wife and I homeschool our four children, and uh, this event has become a pillar in our annual homeschooling journey. And so there are some wonderful, amazing, joy-filled days in the journey, and there are also some isolated days and some lonely days. And so this event stands as an amazing element of encouragement for us. And so I was excited to see encouragement as part of the theme for the day um, because for us, it has been a personal moment of encouragement. Yes, the speakers are unbelievable every year and the vendor hall, we always leave with way more than we expected to when we walked in and we go, this year will be good. We won't buy too much. And then we're walking out like this and get, getting the kids out of the stroller so we can put the toys and the bags and the books in there. Uh, but this year, um, and like every year, one of the things we're most excited about is just the community that we get to have and the faces that we get to see again for 
the first time in a while or faces that we go to church with and just to be around together at this event. So thank you so much. Um, from an Olivet perspective, we love hosting this event. Our students go home in May and this beautiful campus sits empty if you don't come. And so it's incredible to have you here. I love seeing the families um, running around enjoying our campus. And so if this is your first time on Olivet's campus, I hope you begin to enjoy and experience it. If you've been here before, I hope you're getting to know the nuances and the character and the personality of our campus. Um, we believe this is a special place. Our campus and our college has been committed to education with a Christian purpose for over a hundred years. And so we believe that this is a special place that God gave to us and we are still paying the dividends for committing this space to him. And so um, it is just so exciting to be able to see the shared values of ICHE and Olivet at this event um, and to see you enjoying the rock climbing wall and the pool and uh, the planetarium shows. Please live it up and enjoy this campus. Um, one quick note and then I'll be done. For family Families who have students who are considering college, even if they're just in high school, I want to let you know that we have really expanded our dual enrollment opportunities. And so Olivet um, really leaned into the homeschool market specifically for this. We have a great program called Early Scholars. We have tons of classes that are available for students who are juniors or seniors in high school, or really 16 or older. And so they're really affordable. We'll be uh, doing kind of talking about our Early Scholars program in the lobby of the Perry Center. We also this weekend are going to be giving away free classes, entirely tuition-free that a donor has covered so that someone here, many of you actually, will have free courses, free early scholars courses. So if you're interested in that and picking up free college credit from Olivet, they're either online or in person. We have offerings in both. Make sure you stop by our table in Perry and learn a little bit more about the offerings that we have there as well. Students who are younger than that and children who are younger than that, we also have stickers and giveaways. Um, so it is just fun to have you here and great to be a part of this. Thank you for making this possible. I spell board meetings, B-O-R-E-D. I'd rather be beat than go to a board meeting, but there are a few details to keep you reminded of. Uh, first of all, about five years ago, we changed our emphasis. Used to, we just had mainly parents here to encourage the parents to go home. About four years ago, part of the move to this facility was to make this more of a family interactive time. And that's really happened. Uh, with that, though, comes a few challenges. Uh, the questions always ask, can God God do something that, that's impossible. And there's one area in my life that he has not been able to do something, and that is he's never had a kid yell louder than I can preach. Hasn't happened yet. However, each session is going to be recorded, and I do want to encourage you, we want the family there, but if your children start making noises, folks, even good ones. By the way, have I told you I'm a grandparent? Oh, it is the greatest thing alive. She's going to be here in about an hour. If you want to buy tickets to see her, they'll be available. We understand noises, but for the recordings, even if your kids are making fun noises, happy noises, please maybe step out or to the back of the room so it doesn't uh, interfere with the recording. So please remember that. Also, I hope you found your dorm rooms, your linens. Have any questions, go to the info desk. They'll take care of you with that as well. Uh, tonight, every night we've got a lot going on. Uh, tonight, uh, Martin Isles will be speaking from AIG. Look very forward to hearing uh, Martin. That'll be in here, I believe, at 7 o'clock. Uh, also, a meet and greet follows that. Just to go around and shake hands, get to know some people. This is something that the digital age cannot give you you face-to-face, eye-to-eye contact, take advantage of that. Also for young people, which is 62 and then 25 and under, uh, we're going to have a lot of activities for you as well. Uh, next door in the Mackay uh, Gymnasium, we've got volleyball. In the Blanche, we've got basketball. Uh, Coach K and his family, where are you at, Coach K? Where's Coach K at? I don't see him anywhere. I don't see any hands. Okay, well, Evan and his family will be doing relay games, like fun things for those who are not into volleyball. That'll be out here in the lobby at Mackay. I'll be doing that tomorrow night myself. Uh, there are uh, game room downstairs in the bottom of Perry Center. Uh, scavenger hunt's going on. You should have gotten this in your portfolio of stuff that you got when you registered, so check that out. There's a selfie station. There's so much that I cannot keep up with, so use your 
um, packet for all those informations. If you need to track down an ICHE person to ask questions, please feel free to. So let's all stand together. We're going to bless our time. Uh, we're going to start out with some worship after we have prayer. And again, the focus this weekend is not on homeschooling. It's on Jesus Christ because if we seek him and his kingdom first, homeschooling will be added. Amen? Let's pray. Father, as we begin this weekend, Lord, a weekend that you have in your mercy and your providence ordained to touch many, many lives, ours included, God, that's changed us. That's changed our future. That's changed our kids' future, our kids' kids' future. God, we give you all glory, honor, and praise. And Lord, while we want to equip and encourage homeschoolers with math and science and social studies and all those things, we will do that. But God, our main priority is to point everyone to the person of Jesus Christ. And we pray you'll send your Holy Spirit here, God. Lord, the church in America is impotent. The church in America is backslidden. And God, even within the homeschooling community, we see many young people walking away from the Lord. We pray for a revival, for a reformation of your word and of your spirit, God. And oh Lord, how I would like for it to start right here, right now. And so we ask you to send your Holy Spirit to this place. God, whatever the needs are, those who are excited about the future, excited about the possibilities, those who might feel a little beat up right now, as our theme this week is, we pray you'll encourage their hearts. God, bless this time of fellowship. Receive this offering of praise as we start out. This emphasis on Jesus as the Alpha and Omega. In his name we pray. And we all said, amen. amen. on him. 
Revelations 5, 8 says, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation.
Well, Ken Ham needs no introduction to the homeschool community, but I'm going to get him one anyway. Ken is the founder and CEO of Answers in Genesis, the highly acclaimed Creation Museum, and the world-renowned Ark Encounter. He is the author of more than 30 books. Ken and his wife, Mally, reside in northern Kentucky. They have five children and 18 grandchildren and one grandchild. Ken, I'm coming after you. I want you to know that, okay? <laughs> of all things I could say about this man, especially this day and age, he's been a faithful soldier for the cause, for the cause of Christ. So let's welcome Ken Ham. Well, hi, everyone. It's uh, great to be here with you. I'm not sure where we are, but <laughs> it's somewhere in Illinois, I know that. <laughs> but we did find the place uh, eventually. So <clears throat> I come from an organization called Answers in Genesis. We're an apologetics organization, which doesn't mean we apologize for our faith. It means we equip people to defend the Christian faith and we stand on the authority of God's word, proclaim the gospel, and we do many things. So we have, for instance, uh, our publications, we do all sorts of books, we do all sorts of curricula for homeschool, Christian school, Sunday school, etc. And we have our own streaming platform, Answers.tv, which is a little different to Netflix and Disney Plus because it's Christian and non-woke. Uh, so... <laughs> Um, you could repent of your sin if you get those others and just uh, subscribe to ours today. <laughs> we also have the two biggest themed, Christian themed attractions in the world, the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. And uh, how many of you have been to the Ark Encounter, by the way? A uh, number of you. Uh, how many to the Creation Museum? All right, how many have never been to either? Um, well, you need to get down there, don't you? Uh, we keep adding things actually all the time and we'll be opening some more things uh, later this year, uh, particularly at the Creation Museum and some more things at the Ark uh, next year. And if you haven't been there for a while, we've uh, added quite a number of things over the years with the virtual reality experience, the carousel, and we keep adding animals to our zoo at the back. We have a wonderful playground for, for kids. And as well as that, uh, you can go to special live animal programs that we have each day and we have uh, those at the Creation Museum as well. And then go through all three decks of the Ark, 130 different exhibits. And my favorite place is that door with the cross on it. That's the most photographed part of the Ark, actually. At Christmas, we have incredible stunning lights and Christmas programs, concerts, dramas, and some of the most stunning lights you'll ever see uh, at Christmas. And then the, uh, the Creation Museum, which is actually my favorite place because it's got a much more in-depth message of the Bible. And a lot of people end up spending two days actually at the Creation Museum. And we've redone quite a number of the exhibits right now. We're redoing the zoo and we're adding the biggest conservatory in Kentucky, four big glass greenhouses that'll house the plants of the Bible. And we'll have special teaching associated with those. Uh, so we have a planetarium. We've now put in a laser projection system for that, a 4D theater, have some new programs there and some more coming. And then we have the whole walk through the Bible as well, our auditorium where we do all sorts of daily events as we do at the Ark Encounter 2, Insectarium, the dinosaur exhibit, and uh, then the most powerful pro-life exhibit in the world, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, uh, which is so needed in today's world. And then the Christmas programs as well, uh, there, and the live nativity, stunning lights, and we're adding some wonderful uh, additions this year. Uh, as well as that, we have our own Christian school, actually, and we are working on curricula for Christian school and homeschool and online programs. And this is our new headquarters that we are moving into. It was Toyota's national headquarters, and uh, they moved to Texas, and we were able to get this at a fraction of the cost to build a building. And so we renovated this side for our Answers Academy and this side for our headquarters. And just to let you know that uh, we are always looking for uh, specialist people. Uh, we look for college age, high school age to work during the summer, casual um, uh, seasonal workers, and we certainly need a few hundred of those. Uh, and then we have positions in IT and all sorts of other areas as well, if you're interested. And I mentioned to you our answers.tv uh, streaming platform. Also, 
one to mention a brand new book that just came out because the climate change religion is impacting America and it's impacting the world. It is a religion, it's an anti-God religion that worships man, that gives the creation dominion over man instead of man having dominion over the creation. So that's why we produced a book dealing with the scientific and biblical aspects there of climate change. I'll tell you a bit more about some of the resources at the end, uh, but what I'm doing this morning, um, this morning, I should say, is it still morning? No, it's afternoon, that's right. What I'm doing this afternoon is based on uh, the book Divided Nation, Cultures and Chaos in a Conflicted Church. Also this one, uh, Creation of Babel, and that is uh, a walk through Genesis 1 to 11. It's a commentary on Genesis 1 to 11 for the whole family, answering all the most asked questions I've been asked about Genesis 1 to 11. You'll see why as we go through there. So you're here at a, at a, a conference uh, primarily uh, dedicated to homeschooling. And so I thought I would start by giving you a test because you know, you're all involved in education, you all need a test, and it's to see how good you are at uh, worldview. So this is an easy one to start with, okay? Now you all gotta cooperate, put your hands up, even if you get it wrong, doesn't matter. Uh, we're all gonna have fun here. So where was the Garden of Eden located? And you've got a choice there, one, two, three, four, or five. So let me ask, how many said one? Okay, how many said two? <laughs> how many said uh, three? Uh, the majority of you, okay. How many said four? And how many said five? Okay, the correct answer actually is four. So the majority of you failed the test already. We've only just started and you're already failures. Think about that. <laughs> and I suggest to you because, do you know what? Most of us do not think with a true biblical worldview. We're not used to doing it. And I'm gonna to explain today what I mean by a true biblical worldview. Most of the Bible curricula we use is not true biblical worldview. A lot of our curricula is not. In fact, many people don't realize that. You see, if you, what you're doing is you're looking at the, the present world and you know there's a couple of names, Tigers and Euphrates there, and most of our commentaries and most of the books we read will tell us the Garden of Eden was over there in the Middle East. But number one, the Bible says four rivers from one source. You don't see that there. Number two, underneath uh, that area today, there's thousands of feet of sediment with dead things in them, fossils. There was no death before sin. And all those fossil layers, we would say, are the result of the flood of Noah's day. The whole world's been destroyed by a flood. In fact, before the flood, we believe there was one major continent that split up as a result of the flood. Uh, creationists talked about you know, the continent splitting up a long time before evolutionists got hold of that. So the point is, we can't know where the Garden of Eden was. We wouldn't have a clue. And if you wanna know why a couple of the same names are used, well, what happened when the settlers came from England to America in the New World? They used some of the same names from the Old World, right? Happened when they went to Australia. And so you see some similarities there, which is to be expected. So there we are, thinking through this very carefully and starting from the Bible. So, okay, this one this one's, it is um, easy as well. Did kangaroos once live in the Middle East? Uh, yes. Uh, no, none of the above, or they live in Australia. Who would say um, A, Australia only? Who would say B? Who would say C? I got a feeling a lot of you are not cooperating at this stage. <laughs> Just because you failed the first one, but the fact that you haven't put your hand up and you're not putting your hands up, uh, unless you say D, who says D? Yeah, the majority of you did not participate, which means you failed anyway, because it means you don't know, right? So the correct answer is yes. I thought you would have got that from the first one I did, because if you start from God's word, there was a global flood, two of every kind of land dwelling air breathing animal got on the ark, including the kangaroo kind, came off the ark, but where did the ark land? In an area today we call the Middle East. Very simple, right? Okay, you better cooperate with this one. Can you marry your relative? Yes, no, probably only after counseling. Okay. Who would say the answer is A? Who would say the answer is B? Who would say C? Okay, who says D? Okay, actually, most of you failed this one too because the correct answer is A. Can you marry your relative? Because I want you to think about this for a moment. 
If we all go back to two people, Adam and Eve, which we do, there's only one race talking on that issue tomorrow about race, racism, skin color, all that, that's tomorrow. But if we all go back to Adam and Eve, there's only one race, which means we're all one family, we're all Adam's family, we're all related to each other, right? Everyone in this room is related to each other, whether you like it or not, you are. And you're all related to Joe Biden and Donald Trump too, I want you to remember that. <laughs> Um, because, and you're more closely related than I am to them because I am Australian, so I just want you to know that. <laughs> but here, here's the point. The point is, you know, a lot of people can't answer the question, where did Cain get his wife? Why can't they answer that question? Genesis 5.4 says Adam had, had other sons and daughters. There are only two people to start with, brothers married sisters originally. The doctrine of marriage is one man for one woman. You say, but, but, but you're not allowed to marry your, you do marry your relative. It's just today you don't marry a close relative, and we weren't told um, not to marry close relatives until the time of Moses. Abraham was married to his half-sister. The, the, the trouble is today, because of sin, there's mutations or mistakes in our genes, and they've added up over 6,000 years, and if you're closely related, you're more likely got the same mistakes, and they can get together and reinforce each other in offspring, which is why it's better to marry someone further away in relationship from you. But originally, that wasn't a problem because you didn't have those mistakes uh, had accumulated. And so marriage is one man for one woman. So it's easy to answer those questions. Okay, what about this one? T-Rex was created to be omnivore, carnivore, herbivore, or all of the above. Uh, who says A? Who says B? Who says C? Oh, the majority are getting something right for a change. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yep, the answer is C, because Genesis 1, 29 and 30 says, Adam and Eve and the animals originally were vegetarian. And this one here, which one of these is a prehistoric creature? Tyrannosaurus rex, pterodactyl, plesiosaur, or none of the above? Uh, who would say A? Who says B? Who says C? Who says D? You guessed. <laughs> That's what it is, you all guessed. I don't give you that one right, I don't think you knew it. But actually, no, none of the above, because how can you have prehistoric anything when history began from when it was recorded in Genesis 1-1? So there's no such thing as prehistoric animals. So think about that. See, what I was really doing was testing your worldview. That's what I was doing. What is a worldview? I mean, if you look up the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it says a comprehensive conception or apprehension of the world, especially from a specific standpoint. In other words, Everyone has a way of looking at the world. That's called your worldview. Your worldview is like a pair of glasses. Everyone wears a pair of glasses, and your worldview is determined by your religion. See, a lot of people have the idea that some people are religious and some are not. Atheists say they're not religious. That's just plain straight wrong. They are religious. Everyone has a worldview. Everyone has a, has a belief about who they are, where they came from, what life is all about, what its purpose and meaning is, even if you say it's meaningless and purposelessness, like, uh, like uh, atheists would tell us. Your religion determines your worldview. See, a lot of people have the idea that secular is not religious. Secular is neutral. And so they say, oh, our kids go to the secular schools. You know, the Bible says you're either for Christ or what? Against, you walk in light or darkness, you gather or scatter, you build your house on the rock or build your house on the sand. There is no neutral position. There's no such thing as a neutral position. It's like when people say there are no absolutes. Well, that is their one absolute. Think about that, right? Or people say, oh, you Christians, you should allow all beliefs about marriage. You people are intolerant. Wait a minute, they're intolerant of your belief based on the Bible that says there's only one and it's God's view of marriage because he created it. And so there's no neutrality. So atheists are not neutral. Atheists have a religion, right? They are not for Christ, they are against. By the way, remember that too because, you know, I tell people, I, I, I think it, it, re it really helps us, and I, I believe we should do this, really helps us to remind us what's going on in the public schools when instead of calling them secular schools or public schools, I suggest you call them anti-God schools. That is biblical. Because if they're not for Christ, they're against. And then you say to yourself, oh, my kids go to the anti-God school. It'll remind you of what's really going on and what's really happening. Because we need to be reminded of that, of what's happening there. See, if you look up the definition of religion, uh, if you look at number four there from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a cause, principle, system of belief held to with ardor and faith. Well, that's atheism. Everyone has a religion. And in an ultimate sense, do you know how many religions there are? Ultimately. Ultimately, there's only two. 
God's word or man's word? God who knows everything or man? That, that's it. There's only two. And when you mix man's word with God's word, then it's man's word is your foundation. There's only two religions. There's only two foundations that build your worldview. And this really began as a battle 6,000 years ago in a garden when God said to the first man, Adam, Adam, you can eat of all the trees as a test of obedience. There's one tree you're not to eat because if you do, you'll surely die. In other words, Adam, obey God's word. He's the absolute authority. But then what happened? Along came the devil in the form of a serpent who said, did God actually say? In other words, don't trust the word of God. You trust your own word, man's word. You be your own God. You will be like God. And, you know, actually, if you look at Genesis 3, 1 and Genesis 3, 5, we know that we sinned in Adam. That really sums up our sin nature. I want to remind us, everyone has this nature where we want to question God's word. We would rather trust the word of man than the word of God. Hey, I see that in the church all the time. I see it in, in Christian academic institutions all the time. Uh, I, the majority of our Christian leaders who would rather trust man's word about evolution and millions of years instead of God's clear word in Genesis. God knows everything, not man. We should always trust God first. And we want to be our own God. You see that today. You see it in the climate change religion. We want to save ourselves. We want to determine uh, what we can do to save the planet because we're the ones who are the ultimate savior. And so we want to write our own rules. We want to define marriage. We want to define gender. We want to define life. And so it goes on. And so a battle began between two foundations of two religions, God's word and man's word. And on the basis of the foundation you have, you build your worldview. Now, I want you to understand something. This is what many people don't get. The Bible's not just a book of spiritual things, moral things, relationships. The Bible's not just a book of stories. It's not a book that you add to your thinking. This is a revelation from God who knows everything, who's revealed to us a little bit of that information to enable us to have the key information to build the right way of thinking about everything. About everything. You see, I've been asked many times over the past 40 years in this ministry, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? Well, let me tell you the answer. You don't. Because you see, in asking that question, they're looking at the world today and the fossils we find, how do you fit that into the Bible? No, no, no. If you understand worldview, your worldview has a foundation. You have presuppositions. You have beliefs that determine your worldview and therefore the way that you look at everything. You start from God's word first to use the Bible to explain dinosaurs. God tells us when he made land animals. He tells us that two of every kind of those land animals got on board Noah's Ark. He tells us originally all the land animals were vegetarian. Right? You, you admitted that, most of you, just a little while ago. Then the two of every kind came off the ark and increased in number. Over time, those that didn't go on the ark drowned. Many of them turned into fossils. So that then enables us to understand something. And something else the Bible tells us. Death came into the world after sin. There wasn't any death millions of years before sin. There was no millions of years before sin. Death came after sin. So the fossil record had to come after sin. It's a record of death and diseases like cancer and so on. And so when you understand the events that God has revealed to us, look, this happened in the past. Here's the information you need to have. Now build the right worldview so you understand the world correctly. It's the same with an issue like death and suffering. How many times do I have people say to me, oh, how can you believe in a loving God? Look at all the death and suffering. How do you fit all the death, suffering, and disease in, 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 with a loving God? Well, you don't. You start with the Bible to understand this world we live in today is not the world as God made it. It's suffered from, the, from man's sin and the judgment of death and the curse upon the earth and the flood of Noah's day and the Tower of Babel. All these events God's revealed to us so we can build the right way of thinking to understand, oh, it's a groaning world because of sin. Oh, it's not God's fault. Oh, that death and suffering hasn't been here for millions of years. This is groaning because of our sin. And then you realize it's our fault, not God's fault. And you see, when you start from the right foundation, you build the right worldview in everything. And I want to challenge us today that I, I believe most of our homeschoolers, most of our Christian schools are not teaching true biblical worldview. 
Most get the idea, the Bible's sort of over here, you study that nine o'clock on Tuesdays to Fridays or whatever, and then we do, then we do science, and then we do this, and then we, no, we've got to ha- understand, we've got to raise up generations who understand your thinking has a foundation, and in everything, everything, you need to make sure you've got the right foundation and the right worldview, or you will not approach it correctly. See, if you don't start from God's word, you start from man's word. Man's word, there is no God. Everything came about by natural processes. Naturalism is atheism. Therefore, your worldview is when you look at this world, oh, it's gone on like this for millions of years. That's why the climate change people get it all wrong because they, do you realize one of the, one of the main presuppositions found in the foundation for the climate change movement is evolution of millions of years. And therefore, they're gonna get wrong what's happening today. There's many other problems as well. See, we need to understand what the Bible actually is, a revelation from God who knows everything. Now, at the Creation Museum, we have all sorts of exhibits there, but um, our centerpiece is the walk through the Bible, what we call the walk through the seven seas of history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, consummation. Those first four seas, God has revealed to us the history in geology, biology, astronomy, anthropology, that's foundational to the gospel, to all doctrine, to the rest of the Bible. Actually, those first four, four C's are foundational to our Christian worldview. In fact, I'm gonna make a statement. Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. You see, those first four C's, that's from creation through to the Tower of Babel event, that's Genesis 1 to 11. It is the foundation for everything. There is nothing that is not founded in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, nothing. And if you want to deal with any issue, you name the issue, fossils, age of earth, death, disease, marriage, abortion, you name the issue, it doesn't matter what it is, racism, whatever it is, you have to start with the right foundation to have the right worldview. And the right foundation is the first 11 chapters of the Bible, that's why God put them there. Problem, most churches don't teach that, most Christian colleges don't teach that. Most of our Christian academics reject that. Most of them have said Genesis 1 to 11 doesn't matter. You know, trust in Jesus. I mean, we teach doctrine or whatever. And people, we wonder why we're losing generations from the church. We wonder why there's been a catastrophic generational loss. We wonder why most Christians don't know how to deal with all the social issues of the day and many are despairing and say, what do we do? We wonder why we're losing many of our kids to the LGBT movement. Because we haven't taught them the right foundation. And you see, because of that, we are seeing major issues in our church today. There's an incredible exodus from the church. In fact, it was even uh, mentioned uh, here before as uh, uh, the leader was up here. And if you look at America, you go back to the 1700s, 70 to 80% of the total population went to church. Come up to 2010, we're down to 18% of millennials. 2021, come to less than 9% of Generation Z, Something catastrophic has happened in the church. And you know, the the sad thing is many people look at the world and they say, look how bad the world is. Look at all these enemies coming against the church. We should be saying, look how bad the church is. There is something wrong in the church because we're losing those generations. We shouldn't be shocked or surprised at the enemies of God's people because the enemies have always been there since the garden, since, since man sinned and rebelled against God. We can expect these enemies. We shouldn't be shocked by that. We shouldn't be shocked by how bad the world is. We should be shocked by how bad the church is. Because most of our churches are not standing on God's word as they should, particularly when it comes to the right foundation for for our worldview, for our doctrine, for everything. You know, George Varner, a Christian researcher, said in 2018, Generation Z are the first truly post-Christian generation. Post-Christian? That means anti-Christian, right? In other words, we have now a generation that is primarily atheistic. What happened? How did we lose them? What's what's going on? And now we see moral relativism permeating the culture. And we look at that and many Christians say, I don't understand. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? We know why it's happened. Got to go back to Genesis to find out why it happened because man rebelled against God. That's why it happened. And... You know, it's interesting, if you go to 2 Corinthians 11, 3, uh, there, what we read is that Paul has a warning for us that the devil's gonna use the same method on us as he did on 
Eve to get us a position of not believing the things of God. What was the method he used on Eve? To attack God's word. Did God really say? To attack the authority of the word. A battle began 6,000 years ago between God's word and man's word. Now, to put it in our modern context so we understand, on the basis of God's word, you build a Christian worldview, and out of that comes the absolutes of Christianity. God made marriage. God defines life. God defines gender. God defines everything. But when you start from man's word and build a secular worldview, man defines everything, and he redefines what God has defined. And you see, when you look at this, generations ago, the Christian or a Christianized worldview permeated America, permeated the Western world. Because even if people weren't Christians, they still built their morality on the Bible and had a respect for the Bible. But now we've had generations indoctrinated against God's word. We sent them through an education system that educated them against the word of God. And most of our churches have said, oh, you can believe what you were taught at school, evolution, millions of years, doesn't matter. Don't worry about Genesis, Johnny. Just trust in Jesus. But then they become consistent and start to realize that the history in the Bible is not true. This is not infallible. How could this be the word of God? And they walk away from the church. And not only that, when you've got generations with the foundation of man's word, most of our kids, 80, 85% of kids from church homes went through the secular anti-God education system and those that are in the church have that foundation. And instead of giving them the right foundation, most of our leaders said, oh, you can have that same foundation. Just trust in Jesus. Once you've got the foundation of man's word, the LGBT movement can come in and capture them because that's the foundation uh, that enables them to do that. We haven't given them the right foundation. And you see, right now, we're seeing an incredible worldview conflict up here because now moral relativism has become the dominant worldview. This is no longer the dominant worldview. Therefore, people on this side are the enemy. People on this side are considered to be the ones with hate speech, the ones that are misogynist, the ones that are intolerant. And these people are totally intolerant of these over here. And that's the situation we have. But I want you to notice something. Most Christians try to battle it at the worldview level, but they actually the real battle's down here. Because until people have the right foundation of God's word, beginning in Genesis, they're not gonna have the right worldview. You're never gonna solve these issues up here. Which is a reminder to us, government is not the solution to our problems. Legislation is not the solution to our problems. Now, don't get me wrong when I say that. We need to have more Christians with a true Christian worldview in politics voting the right way in accord with a Christian worldview to be sold out there. Trouble is, we don't have many anymore. And that's another change that has occurred. So don't get me wrong, but I want you to understand, in an ultimate sense, regardless, legislation is not the answer. The answer is people change their hearts and minds in regard to God and his word and the saving gospel. That's the only solution. That has always been the solution. And you see, because people don't understand worldview, then they, they don't understand how to deal with what's happening today. For instance, many say to me, well, how do you deal with all those different problems in the culture? There's too many problems. People, they're all the same problem. Do you realize they're not different problems? They're different symptoms of the problem. What is the problem? They have the wrong foundation of man's word. And this is what should make it so obvious to us as Christians. If they're all the same problem, they all have the same solution. What's the solution? The solution has never changed. It's always been God's word and the saving gospel. That's the solution. We need to go out and do our best to defend the Christian faith, proclaim the word of God, stand on the authority of God's word, proclaim the gospel, to do all we can to impact people with God's word and the, and the message of salvation and to raise up godly offspring who have the right foundation and therefore have the right worldview and know what they believe and why and know how to defend the Christian faith. That's what we should be doing. But you know, even a lot of our own Bible curricula is just Bible stories. You know what I mean by Bible stories? Jonah and the Great Fish, Feeding the 5,000, Paul's Missionary Journal, Journey. A lot of the VBS programs are Bible stories. A lot of our Sunday school programs are Bible stories. Now don't get me wrong. I'm talking about events in the Bible that are true. But it's not just a collection of story. And by the way, I would suggest to you, I wanna really challenge you, don't use the word story anymore in regard to the Bible. 
The word story has changed meaning. In, 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 our, in our modern world, in our, our vernacular today, the meaning of the word story primarily means fairy tale. You know what atheists say? I've got quotes from them saying this. The Bible's just a book of stories. Whereas what we teach them about evolution and so on is true. This is real stuff. They learn real stuff at school. They only get stories at church. We have got to understand the changes that have occurred, the way in which words have changed meaning. Many of us have, just don't even understand these things. And I would challenge us, we should be using words like account. Look at the account here in Scripture, the record in Scripture, the historical account here, the, the, the history, this, this historical event. And emphasizing the Bible as a book of history because we live in an era where Bible as a book of history has been attacked. It's not a book of history. It's just mythology. It's just a book of stories. No, it's a book of history. We need to be making sure we're emphasizing that fact. And you see, as I mentioned, the battle in today's world is what the devil said in 2 Corinthians 11:3. I'm going to use the same method on you as I did on Eve, he says. I'm going to create doubt in regard to the word of God. I, he, I call that actually the Genesis 3 attack. And you see, the Genesis 3 attack has manifested itself down through the ages. But you know, the devil also changes the way in which he does things. Things don't always stay the same. The attack, the fundamental attack has always been the same. There's always been an attack on God's word. But I would ask this question. How does the Genesis 3 attack manifest itself in the era we live in? See, if you go back to the time of, of uh, Peter and Paul, uh, first century, do you think anyone asked them about carbon dating? No, it's a 20th century invention. Do you think anyone asked Martin Luther in the 16th century about dinosaurs? Well, the word dinosaur wasn't even invented until 1841. It's just an arbitrary term uh, that a man invented. That's all for a particular group of land animals. Down through the ages, people have had to battle at times about the deity of Christ, about the bodily resurrection, about the miracles in the Old Testament, about the virgin birth, about salvation by grace through faith. What's the Genesis 3 attack of this era? And you see, the interesting thing is, I've traveled all over the world for the past 40 years, and you know what I found? No matter what country, I mean, it can be a third world country, when people know you want about the Bible, Christianity, the gospel, Jesus, they ask the same basic sorts of questions. And they go sort of like this. Well, don't we live in a scientific age? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? How do you know the Bible's true? What evidence is there for God? Who made God? You believe in Adam and Eve, where did Cain get his wife? Well, how did all the races come about? There are only two people to start with. Where's the evidence of the flood? Don't fossil layers prove millions of years in evolution? We know man evolved from ape-like creatures. How could the story of Adam and Eve be true? How can you believe in a loving God with all the death and suffering we see in the world? Didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago and evolved into birds? How could Noah fit all the animals on the, the ark? Hasn't science proved evolution is true? Isn't the Bible an outdated book of mythology? Just for interest, put your hands up if you've heard those sorts of questions. Oh, do you, do you see it? Oh, boy, that's a shock. Hands all over the room. No, it's not a shock. That happens anywhere I go and speak when I ask that. You know why? We recognize the Genesis 3 attack type questions of today. And you notice something? They primarily relate to tacking the Bible as a book of history. They primarily relate to the fact we live in a so-called scientific age. And they're primarily an attack on Genesis 1 to 11. But I'm going to ask you another question. And don't put your hands up for this. Just think. How many of you can answer those questions? How many of you taught your children to answer those questions? How many of your pastors are teaching you to answer those questions in your churches? Because in the majority of instances, that is not happening. And that's just some of them. There's tons more. And you see, as I said, what's happening today particularly is an attack on God's word, particularly in Genesis chapters 1 to 11. So what can we do? I'm going to challenge us that here's what we need to do. Now, by the way, that was the introduction. My talk now officially starts. I just had to <laughs> get the introduction out of the way so I can now start. Okay. Okay. We need to be raising up generations who know how to think foundationally, starting from God's word in Genesis 1 to 11, and equipped with apologetics. What's the word apologetics means? It comes from the word, Greek word that's translated defense or answer in many translations. Uh, it, it's translated from the Greek word apologia. That's where we get a word apologetics, which means to give a logical reason defense of the faith. 
that's what we do at the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter. That's what we do with our books, our curricula. We include apologetics. You see, when you walk through those seven seas at the Creation Museum, we walk you through Genesis 1 to 11. We're saying, here's what the Bible says. Now, here are the ways in which that's attacked. Let us give you the answers uh, to show that, for instance, science confirms uh, the Bible's history. We're teaching you to have a Christian worldview. And so here's what I want us to understand. I'm just going to do a little summary of some practical examples here for the rest of this talk. When you're dealing with any issue, I want you to remember, number one, Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. So you want to deal with any issue, any issue whatsoever, you start with Genesis 1 to 11. Now, I'm going to go and ask you a series of questions, and, and I want you to yell the answers out this time. Now, you might say, I got them wrong last time. That's okay. I'm going to tell you the answer. Well, how will I remember all the answers? All the questions we're going to ask have the same answer. Well, how do I know what that is? It's on the screen. <laughs> okay, so after I count to three, I want you to say after me, you start with Genesis 1 to 11 in a nice loud voice. You ready? One, two, three. You start with Genesis 1 to 11. Okay, you'll never forget this. Once, once we go through this, you're not going to forget this, right? How, I got a question for you. How would you deal with gender? What's your answer? You start with Genesis 1 to 11. Wow, that's good. You're right. Let me show you how it works. See, people, this is how we should be teaching our children. This is how our churches should be teaching us. Not just a book of stories. We should be teaching the Bible. Yes, we teach those accounts in Scripture, but we should be teaching the Bible as a record of history. And Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything so we can develop our worldview, our doctrine, and understand it all and know what we believe. Genesis 1:27. God made man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. Oh, there's only two options. <laughs> Have you noticed that? There's only two options. Do you know that President Biden had the audacity on Easter Sunday to send out a tweet promoting uh, and, and, and condoning transgender uh, movement and saying, you know, we, we love transgender people. You're made in the image of God. Well, that comes from the Bible. We read it first in Genesis 1.26 and then Genesis 1.27, but what did not Joe Biden do? Quote the rest of the verse that says, male and female, he created them. And by the way, we don't just love transgender people one day of the year, we should love them 365 days of the year, and loving them means we're gonna tell them the truth about who created them, who they are, and the truth of God's word and help them understand that there's only two genders male and female. <laughs> Genesis 5.2, male and female, he created them. There's no other options. All the way through the Old Testament, male or female. When you go to the New Testament, when Jesus, who is God, when he was asked as the God-man about marriage, he said, haven't you read the authority of the word? Haven't you read who created them from the beginning, made them male and female? There he is attesting to two genders and to the historicity of Genesis. He did it again in Mark 10.6. Now, here's a little apologetics for you. We know that we're made of 23 pairs of chromosomes made up by, by DNA, that molecule of heredity. It makes up our chromosomes. And we have a pair of sex chromosomes. Males have a pair of, that's XY. Females have XX. Amazing. There's science confirming two genders. Wow, who would have expected that? Anyone who believed the Bible. You would expect that. Now, be ready for the world. We should always be getting our kids to be ready for the world. Because you know what the world always does? They like to use exceptions to negate the rule. We have to understand why there's the exceptions. And you know, to understand that, you have to start from Genesis 1 to 11. It's true. You see, are there exceptions? Well, you know, there are some people that can have three X's and some two X's and a Y, and they have all sorts of problems because of that but they're a fraction of a percent of the population, which means that's not the general order. So why do they exist? Oh, how do you deal with genetic problems? You start with Genesis. 
to deal with genetic problems? Of course, because it's not a perfect world anymore. Because when man sinned, God no longer holds everything together perfectly. Uh, God withdrew some of that sustaining power. Now things run down. There are mutations. There are mistakes. And those mutations uh, can, uh, can cause problems in our chromosomes. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, the whole creation groans. It's not just sex chromosomes, but others that also have exceptions, if you want to call them that, have problems. But you see, it, it, because we know we live in a fallen world, we can understand why they uh, exist. That's why we get sick. That's why we have all sorts of diseases. But you know what the secular world is telling young people? It's telling young people, you can trust your feelings. Let me ask you this, from a Christian worldview perspective, can you trust your feelings? No. Say it out again. No. no, you can't. How do we know that? know that? You start from Genesis 1 to 11. You can't trust your feelings. Why? Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. So what they're told today is, oh, you biologically were born a boy, but you feel you should be a girl. Oh, well, you can trust your feelings. You know the problem? Only, non only Christians are the ones who can understand, no, you can't trust your feelings, which again reminds you the answer and solution to all of this is God's word, because until they understand and believe that, they're not going to understand about their sin nature. See, that's why my parents taught us scripture like, I have stored up your word in my heart so I might not sin against you. They reminded us that you can't trust your feelings and your behavior and your feelings have to be always judged against the absolute authority of God's word because God's word is the absolute authority. It's not a guidebook. This is the word of God who knows everything. This is the foundation for everything. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. You know, a good lesson for us is uh, when God spoke to Cain, we know from even the New Testament that Cain had a heart problem. And God warned Cain before he killed Abel, Cain, your sin nature, it desires you. It wants to master over you. Don't let it master over you. You need to master over it. He let it master over him and he killed his brother Abel. Because he didn't listen to God's word. And you see, we need to make sure every day as Christians, we continually look to God's word, look to the Lord Jesus Christ to conform to the image of Christ, to, to judge everything against God's word because we can let sin master over us in regard to our roles in marriage, our, our, our roles as a father or mother. I'm gonna talk about that uh, later today when I deal with the family, which is the first and most fundamental of all human institutions God ordained in scripture. And it's under incredible attack. And most people don't know how to raise up godly offspring. Most people don't, don't understand the, the roles that God has said you are to have because we live in a world that's affected us and we've secularized our thinking. No, you need to make sure you've got the right way of thinking from God's word. But always remember this, you know, because of our sin nature, those temptations to do that which is wrong rather than that which is right are very great. And in fact, our nature is that we're more likely to do bad than, than good, good because our nature is we want the bad. That's our nature. That's who we are. But there's no temptation that we can't overcome in Jesus Christ. And again, a reminder, the solution is in Christ. The solution is in the gospel. And we've got to remember that. Okay, let's try another one. How would you deal with the topic of marriage? What do you think the answer is? Great, you remember that. God created man in his image, male and female, he created them. How did he make the man? He made man directly from dust. Not an ape man. I can't believe the number of clergy that say this represents evolution. The Bible says we come from dust and we return to dust when we die. We don't return to an ape man when we die, right? And God said it's not good, not good that man should be alone. Why was man alone? Because only man was made in the image of God. No animals were. That's why God brought the animals to Adam to show the difference between him and the animals. There was none like him, right? He didn't find a help. He didn't look at a female chimp and say, she's close enough, I'll date her. <laughs> and so God took the man's rib and made the first woman. You know, I don't know if I've got time to do this. Anyway, days like a thousand years. So, uh, <laughs> I can't believe over the year, 40 years in this ministry, 
And the number of people, even homeschoolers, that have asked me a particular question, I'm thinking, what is wrong with the church that they don't, they don't know this? And um, I, I was asked it recently at a conference, I was in North Carolina, and at the end of the talk, I had a question time, and a guy got up, and he asked me this question, and I go, good grief. I don't say that out loud, I just, I think lots of things in my mind when you ask questions, I just don't say it. But, <laughs> I thought to myself, I can't believe he's asking this question. What is wrong with people? But I've been asked it so many times over the years. You know what he said? He said, if God took Adam's rib and made a woman, how come men don't let her have one less rib than a woman? <laughs> and I looked at the group and I said, well, let me ask you this. If you were a young man and had an accident on the freeway and lost a leg and then you got married and had kids, are they all gonna be one-legged kids? <laughs> And the whole audience goes, oh. <laughs> In other words, oh, we didn't think of that. Oh, it's genetics, oh, of course, oh. I know all of you knew the answer to that question already. I could tell that from the very first question I asked you. So, Hey, you know what, uh, actually, if, if God left the outer covering, the periosteum of the rib, it actually would regenerate anyway. Uh, we don't know that he did that, but the point is it is a bone, the only one that can regenerate like that. So, let's jump over to the New Testament. When, uh, uh, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, what do we read? Woman was made from man. Oh, Paul says that twice. He, woman wasn't made from an ape woman. She was made from man, man was made from dust. And then, we get to Genesis 2, 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and there'll be one flesh. That is the creation of marriage. That is where marriage comes from. I wanna ask you a question. Who created marriage? God, not Joe Biden or the Supreme Court justices. God did. Who defines marriage? God, not the Supreme Court justices. Do you know what's happening in our world today? I tell you what's happening in our world today. Everything God defines and created, when man rebels against God, he wants to be his own God, he redefines it the way he wants to. What are we seeing? Man redefining gender, man redefining marriage, man redefining dominion, man redefining work, man redefining life, man is redefining everything because he wants to be God. You know, it's interesting in the New Testament when Jesus was asked about marriage, he quoted male and female, and then he said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and two will be one flesh. There's Jesus quoting Genesis 2.24, basically. It's the text of Genesis 2.24. He's asserting the historicity of Genesis and that marriage is one man and one woman because God created it and it's founded on Genesis 1 to 11. And if your kids haven't got that right foundation and they still got the foundation of man's word, don't be surprised when the LGBT movement captures them. And by the way, not just marriage, ultimately every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. You start to think about it. Where's the origin of sin? Genesis 1 to 11. Death, Genesis 1 to 11. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is he called the last Adam? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven day week? Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have dominion? Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have to work hard now in the sweat of his brow? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we wear clothes? Because God gave clothes because of sin. Genesis 1 to 11. Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for everything. And if you want to have a true Christian worldview and raise up your kids to really understand what they believe and why, you have to start there, and then you have to equip them with answers to the attacks on God's word today that are, that are leveled by the, by the atheists, and not just the atheists, but many in the church. Uh, many of our churches have resorted to nothing but entertainment, and they're shallow, and that's what it's become because they've gotten away from the foundation of God's word beginning in Genesis 1 to 11. Okay, a couple more real quickly. How do you deal with abortion? Oh, say that again, you're getting weak again. Oh, okay. God created man in his own image. What's that got to do with abortion? Everything, because man is not an animal, right? Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. There's no difference, you're just an animal. 
Now, how did God make the animals? Let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to their kind. How did he make man? Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the creation. Not the other way around. So when you're dealing with the environment, you have to start from Genesis 1 to 11. And by the way, just a, a quick little aside here. You know, there's the doomsday clock. We're going to destroy the earth in so many years and all the rest of it. And it's created fear amongst people and there's fear amongst young people saying, you know, we, we shouldn't have children. Do you notice the modern climate change movement is causing a lot of young people to say we shouldn't have children? Where does God say, what does God say? Be fruitful and multiply, right? But you realize the modern climate change movement, which is based on evolution, man is a blight on the environment and the creation should have dominion over man. And we're never going to destroy the earth, as they say. Because after the flood, God promised Noah, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. We're not going to destroy it. Now, we need to look after it, but we need to use it for man's good and God's glory. God's given us all sorts of resources to use. And the modern climate change movement wants that to have dominion over man and stop man doing that. And it hurts man. You know, when I was a teacher, I was taught, there were, taught the students from the textbooks that said there were six kingdoms of life. And you know, most of our textbooks, I'll guarantee most of what you teach your kids will say man is in the animal kingdom. Is that right? But you see, that's a problem. That's not a Christian worldview. Because if you use the criterion made in the image of God, man should be separate. And I'll tell you why that's important. Because today, the secularists want to teach your kids that they're just animals. You go to the Cincinnati Zoo, which is just across the river from the Cretia Museum, you visit the apes and the chimps, and they tell you you're visiting your family. And they actually say this. We are not, after all, the only beings with personalities, rational thought, and emotions. There's no sharp line dividing us from the chimps and other apes we humans are a part of, not separate from the animal kingdom. Wait a minute. See, you're just a part of it. You're just an animal. And when they say there's no sharp line dividing us from chimps and other apes, every zoo I go to has a sharp line. You know, it's important to understand that humans are made in the image of God. We're separate. That's what we should be teaching them. And you see, in sexual reproduction, you get DNA from the male, DNA from the female. You get fertilization. And when you have a fertilized egg, you have a unique combination of information different to the mother, different to the father, different to any other human being ever and ever will be. And you see, when that egg develops into our body, no new information is ever added. It means we're made in God's image right from fertilization. Abortion is killing a human being right from fertilization, not from 15 weeks. And remember that. And you know, I encourage you today not to use the word conception. A lot of us say we're human, humans made in God's image from conception. Do you know why I say don't use conception? They've redefined conception. In our Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit, we show you what they've done. The latest medical dictionaries, the older ones say conception is fertilization. The newer ones, conception, implantation in the womb. Why did they change the definition? To justify the use of abortion drugs to abort a fertilized egg before it implants in the womb. So use the term fertilization, is what I would encourage you. And you know, God looks at it this way. You needed me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. While you were, your body was still forming, it's still you. And yet you have Kamala Harris and all these people out there today shouting, my body, my rights. And they use terms like abortion care and health care. It's not health care, it's death. It's not abortion care, it's death. Death to an individual, to a child. It's murder. It's child sacrifice to the God of self. There's man wanting to be his own God. I want to do what I want with sex and get rid of the consequences however I want because it's all about me. It's man's sin nature. And by the way, a fertilized egg is not part of a woman's body. I mean, if it's a male, where'd the Y chromosome come from? Not from the woman. And not only that, do you realize when you, ha you have a kidney transplant, you have to have anti-rejection drugs, your body recognizes the foreign tissue? You know, uh, a woman's body recognizes a fertilized egg as foreign tissue. And we're rejected except God built in a complex anti-rejection mechanism. Wow. 
Amazing. Make sure you spend time in our fearfully and wonderfully made exhibit. And don't forget this, and I always want to say this because I know there are many that have been involved in various ways, in abortion or whatever. And remember this, God is a gracious, loving, forgiving God. Consequences are always there in this fallen world. But nonetheless, he says, if you uh, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from unrighteousness, he removes our sins as the east is from the west, and remember them no more. And all the teaching that we have there is in this wonderful book and this one here for children. Okay, one more I want to do. I'm going to do another one tomorrow on the race issue and about skin color and race and racism and all that sort of thing. But we'll do this one as the last one, and then I'll sum it up for you. Remember I said, how do you deal with death, suffering, and disease? You don't say, how does that fit with the Bible? You? Exactly, the origin of death. Corruption, that second C in the Creation Museum. God said everything he made was very good. There was no death or violence in the world or disease. But Adam, if you eat of that one tree, you disobey, you will die. Adam ate, there's the origin of sin, there's the origin of death. When man did that, God immediately promised a savior. Now it's a whole nother talk. I could talk for an hour on just Genesis 3.15. It's the whole Bible's message in one verse. But that one would come to crush the head of the serpent, but he would be wounded in doing that, which he was on the cross. He was fatally wounded, but he rose from the dead. It's a promise of the Savior. And then in Genesis 3.21, it's the origin of clothing. God made garments of skins and clothed them. It's the first blood sacrifice as a covering for their sin, a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so when you walk through the Creation Museum and you see the first sacrifice scene, it's a reminder, this doesn't take away our sin, it's a covering for our sin, it's pointing to the fact that one day, one will come to take away our sin. You see, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins because life of the flesh is in the blood. Because death was a penalty for sin, there has to be the giving of life to pay the penalty for sin. But it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sin, why? because they're not humans made in the image of God, they are animals. And so you see, a man brought sin and death into the world, a man would need to pay the penalty for sin and death. We're all descendants of Adam, but we're all sinners, so how can one of us pay the penalty? God steps into history to be one of us, but a perfect man, the God man, to die on a cross. Death is an enemy, remember, it's an intrusion to be raised from the dead and offers that free gift of salvation. Wow. If you believe in millions of years as a Christian, I'd say the majority of Christian leaders do, from all our research. Probably the majority of Christians do. They say, what's wrong with believing in millions of years? Well, the idea of millions of years came out of atheism of the 1800s, the belief that all those fossil layers were laid down millions of years before man. That's where the idea came from. But in the fossil record, you have lots of examples of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs, but the Bible says originally the animals were vegetarian. We weren't told we could eat meat until after the flood, just as I gave you the plants, he says, now I change your diet. If you believe in millions of years in the fossil record, there's lots of evidence of cancer and arthritis and abscesses and all sorts of diseases. How could that exist before sin when God said everything he made was very good? These two things can't be true at the same time and if what I'm saying is right, that death, bloodshed, disease, and suffering is a consequence of sin, and death is an enemy, as the Bible says, it'll be one day thrown in the lake of fire, then all those layers of fossils can't be millions of years old. How do you understand fossils? You start from Genesis 1 to 11. If there was a global flood, you'd find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth, and you do. How do you deal with racism? You start from Genesis 1 to 11, and we're gonna deal with that tomorrow and help you understand we're all one race, we're all the same skin color, actually, just different shades, and science actually confirms all of that. And you see, what I am saying to us is this. Imagine if we were to raise up generations who knew what they believed, had the right foundation, equipped to be able to defend the Christian faith. Wow, we pray they would survive that tornado of moral relativism. And you see, which is, that tornado has captured so many of the younger generation. Here's the battle. 
And the devil knows how do you knock out the Christian worldview? You attack God's word. And in this day and age, the attack has been focused on Genesis 1 to 11 from with, uh, out and within the church, which is why most people say, how do we deal with all these problems, which are not problems, they're symptoms. And so what we want to do is help raise up generations with the right foundation, right worldview, know what they believe in why, equip with answers to defend the Christian faith, know how to deal foundationally with the battle down here. Only then can we start to deal with these here. Now, just before I, I finish, I want to tell you just a little bit about our resources in the exhibit hall and, uh, and want to announce this too. Tonight, executive uh, CEO, actually, uh, we appointed Martin as part of uh, the succession for the future. Uh, because we all get older and we've got to make sure that we're maintaining the ministry for the future. He's a great thought leader and so um, we will, you'll see more of him over the years and um, to, to lead uh, more and more in this ministry. And I'm going to stay here as long as God allows me. When people say to me, what's your philosophy of retirement? The same as Moses. Uh, so you can look that up if you don't know what I mean. Tonight at 7.30, he's speaking on living in Babylon. Do you, do you, you know, one of, the, one of the emphases he's bringing is people, we don't live in a Christianized culture anymore. We're living in a pagan culture like Babylon. And how do we raise up Daniels who are able to live in Babylon? And people like um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's a challenge for us as Christians. Now, let me just tell you that um, we're offering you 20% off all of our individual books at our uh, booth that we have. That excludes the discounted packs and the magazine subscriptions. Um, the cream of the crop of our apologetics books for teens and the youth. What I do today is based on this one, Divided Nation, this one, Creation of Babel, Genesis 1 to 11, commentary for the whole family. I'm speaking on this this afternoon, the family. It's really the case for homeschooling. It's a case for Christian education. And it's really all about the family. And uh, this here answers book one, the top 25 Genesis 3 attack questions of our day. We have five answers books altogether. This is on evangelism, how do you evangelize a culture that's changed foundation. And this one Martin wrote called Who Am I? It's about the identity issue. Um, and and how, how do you find your identity? It's a big issue with the younger generation. Our identity is in Christ, of course. And then we have this cream of the crop for our children. Why did God make me a girl and make me a boy? The most asked questions answered, one blood for kids, not, and so on. And then added to that my book on death and suffering based on a real life example in our own family, dealing with the death of a younger brother who was a Bible teacher uh, at very young age. And, and my father at 66, my mother lived through to 92. But how did we cope with that? She was a great woman of faith. And she struggled, like all of us struggle, but this has, this has those real life struggles in here with answers many others don't. But she always um, never questioned her, her faith and was a great witness for the Lord. And we have the climate change book. We do have a homeschool Bible curriculum that is apologetics, biblical worldview, uh, and uh, it is for uh, K to five, but you can extend that through to six, seven, and eight and above even, there's so much material there. We have a Truths for Toddlers uh, curriculum. We have this one on the seven C's for kindergarten through grade two. Um, we have, um, I mentioned the Answers Bible curriculum to you. We have a, a Bible curriculum for Christian schools now. We've released the first three grades of that. Uh, we have this wonderful timeline of scripture. And we have books on forensic science and astrophysics, a curricula that you can use. Uh, this one's to help you thrive in a secular world and how to defend the faith. There's lots of materials that you'll see there out at our uh, booth. I encourage you to come visit us and also to get our answers.tv uh, streaming platform. And so there's so much more that we could say. Um, and uh, come and ask us about our Answers magazine. We have a children's magazine that you can subscribe to. We give you a free gift if you subscribe. With that, I'll hand back and I'll be seeing some of you at the next two sessions that I do, one today and one tomorrow. I think that was a great foundational talk to start the weekend off. Amen. Uh, the vendor hall is at 3.30, one hour from now. We've got about 10 minutes for your next session. You are dismissed. God bless.